So we'll move on straight to the next presenter, uh, Prashant. Prashant is a research scholar in humanities and social sciences here in IIT Gandhinagar. And he's doing research that deals with Eastern and Western elements in the oeuvre of Georges Louis Borges. And his talk today is titled, Self, No Self, The Refutation of Enduring I in Zen and Tao. Over to you, Prashant. Thank you. So, uh, before starting, uh, let me speak about uh, one of the Zen parables and which will in some way set the mood of the entire presentation. So, two Zen students are arguing about this stone which is before them and they are looking at the stone from the perspective of subjectivity and objectivity and they are arguing and being exhausted after arguing about it so much and while they were arguing the master is just walking beside them and they listen to the argument of these two students so these two students ask the master that what this stone is whether it is our subjective perception or whether it has its own objectivity the master coincidentally was blind so he would ask whether this stone is heavy and uh, the students replied, yes. So the master says, why don't you just let it go? Why are you carrying it? So, yeah. So this is the order of my presentation. This is uh, how I am going to uh, present. So the first thing which I am going to speak about is Descartes' idea of I and how he comes to this point, this Archimedean point, this stable point. And why is it that he is striving in his uh, book, Meditations on the First Philosophy, about uh, having this conception of I? So as you can see that he is from the very beginning looking for this firm and abiding superstructure in the sciences. And he is doing it just for the sake of the striving for some firm basis so that knowledge can be created. And he takes it from Plato. Plato says that uh, no knowledge needs certain certainty. And at the same time, he would also refute Plato when he would say that this conception of the world is illusionary or idealistic. So he would reject the notion of idealism in Plato. At the same time, he would also take into consideration the idea of uh, this <coughs> certainty, which uh, speaks about the, the idea of how there should be a firm and immovable basis. So uh, this comes from an anxiety. Anxiety for what? Anxiety for meaning. Anxiety for a structure which should have a foundation. And uh, Richard Bernstein speaks about it, that either there is some support for our being a fixed foundation for our knowledge, or we cannot escape the forces of darkness that envelop us with madness, with intellectual and moral flaws. Now, the question is, why are we refuting this I? And why, why is it that the Buddhist, or for that matter, a Zen and Tao uh, schools of thought are contradicting this idea of an enduring self? So, uh, According to Walpur Rahula, he states that how this notion of enduring self produces the harmful thoughts of me and mine, self is desire, craving, attachment, hatred, ill will, and so on. So, Buddhist notion of no self shouldn't be looked as an opposite of self because we have a different paradigm for that. For example, the opposite of self, we say in a general term, is other, but no self is certainly different from that. It doesn't involve in that duality. It doesn't involve in that play, and in some way it is away from play. So the play happens when there is a language, but the notion of no self does not conform to language. 
So uh, about this, uh, there are five points which I have mentioned that how uh, the no shelf is actually the natural result of the analysis of skandhas or aggregates. And what are those aggregates? Matter, sensation, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. We see that all of these are changing constantly. It's like whatever you are experiencing, it has an impact on your consciousness. And whatever you are being aware of, it is also changing your experience. So it is working in a continuous loop, a loop where the experience is getting changed by your uh, consciousness and consciousness is getting changed by your experience. Now, uh, this Buddhist notion of no shelf uh, can be also looked upon uh, as not conforming to the idea of an absolute God or for that matter, an absolute entity which causes something. So uh, there is no such thing in Buddhism which initiates any sort of causality. So in some way, Descartes was also looking for that place in some way which causes or which, which will be the basis for the formation of all other form of knowledge. But in Buddhism, it is all about letting it go, as I have presented in the very beginning through the story. So the ultimate in Buddhism is neither conditioned nor unconditioned, neither relative nor absolute, and neither temporal nor eternal. It speaks about a sort of sunyata, an emptiness, but this emptiness shouldn't be looked in a negative term. Why is, should it not be looked in from the perspective of negation? Because uh, in some way, the emptiness can also be looked upon as the middle way, which does not conform to the eternalist point of view. At the same time, it does not speak about the nihilist sense of being in emptiness. For example, a depressed person would say that because I am having this no cell, that's why I am getting depressed because I'm not doing anything, that's why I'm getting depressed. But at the same time, you are thinking of some standard where you should be, and only after being at this state, you will be at peace. But no shelf is all about being one with what you are, what state you are already in. It is not about having or you know, achieving or accomplishing a different state. So now uh, let me uh, speak about the idea of Tao, which should be, um, should, can be connected with the idea of emptiness in Buddhism. So the Tao that, cannot, that can be told is not eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The nameless, the unnameable is the eternal, eternally uh, real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. What does it mean? It means the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. So in some way, we can understand from this that the Tao cannot be expressed or represented in language. So Tao does not comes into language. In some way, it is beyond language. And here I would like to make a demarcation that uh, Tao is more of an experiential state than an existential or ontological state. After that, uh, Tao does not take sides, since it does not conform to any sort of dualities, but at the same time, it, do, uh, it consists of all those dualities, but it doesn't look at those dualities in opposites. Those dualities come from Tao, but those dualities are not in chaos with each other. They are not the opposition of each other. Because there is a light, that's why there is not no darkness. The light and the darkness are not the opposites. They, are, they can be looked upon as the extension of each other, perhaps, in some way. They are in terms with each other, in some sort of singularity with each other. And there is no, uh, we can't just make a distinction between them on the basis of opposites. Now, uh, this can be better elaborated through this, when uh, Tao is at the absolute state 
this absolute shouldn't be confused with the absolutist notion or idealist notion. The, abs uh, the, Tao, the great Tao, when the great Tao is forgotten, at the same time, goodness and piety appear. When the body's intelligence declines, cleverness and knowledge step forth. When there is no peace in family, filial piety begins. When the country falls into chaos, patriotism is born. So we see that we make a distinction or we make a demarcation only when we fall from the state of Tao. And dualities come into existence only when we are not one with Tao. The moment we become one with Tao, the moment we experience Tao, at the same time, we forget or let it go. Let it go of what? Let it go uh, all those dualities which are in some way entwining our daily life. <clears throat> now here, um, just to speak about this subtle difference, the subtle difference uh, between the Tao which I am speaking about and the notion of truth in uh, Western philosophy, uh, we can see that how um, it is in bold, it is beyond is and is not. But at the same time, the is and is not comes from Tao. Tao does not exclude is not. There is that absence also in the Tao. But at the same time, if you look at um, the permanent statement, he's saying that uh, the first, namely that it is, and that it is impossible for it not to be. Here, it is the truth, it is the way of belief, for truth is its companion. The other, namely, that it is not, and that it must needs not be, that I tell thee, is a path that none can learn of at all. So in some way, we, we can see that how Parmenides is taking it for granted that, that what is not sh should not even be understood and look at the choice of the word. He uses the word must. Of course, it is a translated text, but I went through multiple translations and I could see that this word must recurs in all those translations. So he is emphasizing upon what is can only be understood or can be analyzed and what is not should be lift. So he, he lifts it right there. Now, these are a few uh, Jain Kuan. Jain Kuan can be uh, looked upon as both a certain question and also answer. It, dep it depends upon who is reading this Kuan. For some people, it can be a question. For example, has a dog Buddha nature? This is the most serious question of all. If you say yes or no, you lose your own Buddha nature. So the moment you confirm to affirmation or to some negation, you are in that loop at the same time. So Jain speaks about, and here Jain and Tao, because, uh, let me uh, speak about this also, that how Bodhisattva in 520 AD went to China and spread uh, Buddhism, and that became Tao later, and uh, at the same time, um, this went on and uh, Japan I uh, spoke about it in terms of Jain. So the idea of no self, Tao, and Jain can be looked upon parallelly. Here, this one is quite interesting. Daibai asked Basu, what is Buddha? Basu said, this mind is Buddha. Now, it can be um, uh, quite a contradiction that at the same time we are talking about no self, and at the same time, uh, the master is saying that this mind is Buddha. Buddha also, the moment you speak of Buddha, you confirm to a sort of personality, the personal, personality of Buddha. And uh, Buddha also comes under language. So if you have to achieve Jain or Tao or no self, you have to reject Buddha also, because that too also comes under the context of language. And Jin, Tao, or no self does not confirm to any language. The last one, and in some way this will be the conclusion. Dofuku said, in my opinion, truth is beyond affirmation or negation, for this is the way it moves. 
Bodhisattva replied, you have my skin. The nun Soji said, in my view, it is like another sight of the Buddha land seen once and forever. Bodhidharma answered, you have my flesh. Dofuku said, the four elements of light, airiness, fluidity and solidity are empty, that is inclusive. And the five skandhas are no things. In my opinion, no thing is reality. Bodhidharma commented, you have my bones. Finally, Ika bowed before the master and remained silent. Bodhidharma said, you have my marrow. So at the end we see that it is all about silence. So in some way, silence is the way which leads us to mindfulness. Like when master would ask, think of one hand sound and the disciple would come with different answer every time that one, one hand sound is the sound of a crystal willow or again he would come and speak about how the stream or, or for that matter the, the movement of wind and in the same way he would speak about different sort of sounds and at the end when he would contemplate on it silently with precision, with mindfulness he would come to a state of the soundless sound and this is all what we are talking about the Tao, the Zen or for that matter no self all of these things are about being silent. To be silent is not to conform to any realities. Thank you.